Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sue Staniforth, and I'm the Education and Outreach Manager with the Invasive Species Council of BC. Thanks to all of you for joining us today for this webinar, which is called Grasshoppers of Concern to the Caribou's Agricultural Sector. We're very lucky to have with us today Dr. Dan Johnson, who is the Professor of Environmental Science at the University of Lethbridge. Dan will provide an overview of the range of grasshoppers present in the caribou, their impacts on the agricultural sector and mitigation tactics. We at the Council have received lots of questions about grasshoppers, I think because they're such a visible and well-known insect to many of us. I hope everybody had a chance to sign in early and get any technical glitches worked out. If you're still experiencing any problems, write a note to us in the chat box, which you'll see in the right-hand column of your screen, and we'll see if we can give you a hand. Everybody has been muted, so you should only be able to hear myself and Dan. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the chat box in the right-hand column of your screen. Dan will be taking some time at the end of the presentation to discuss questions. If we run out of time to address all of the questions, we'll send out the questions and answers to you all by email. To begin with, we'd like to find out who's here and where you all work or what your areas of interest are. If you haven't already, can you all please type in your name and workplace or your area of interest into the chat box and we can review these while I'm introducing Dan. Thanks so much. Great. Well, it looks like lots of folks are joining us and typing their, their information in. Um, at this point, I'm really pleased to give a warm welcome and introduction to Dr. Dan Johnson. Dan is currently a Professor of Environmental Science at the University of Lethbridge, Alberta. He received his PhD from UBC at the Institute of Animal Resource Ecology and the Department of Plant Science, where he worked on soil arthropods, biocontrol of orchard mites, and computer models of development and predation. Dan's area of research um, includes biogeography, environmentally sustainable agriculture, entomology, rational pest management, and biological control. He's also conducting work in areas of insect movement, biometeorology, alternatives to chemical pesticides, and insects as vectors of plant diseases. Dan has been president of the Entomological Society of Canada, and before joining the University of Lethbridge, he was a senior scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Lethbridge Research and Development Centre. We're really pleased that Dan is joining us today. He's going to give us an overview of the range of grasshoppers, um, some of their impacts, and also some of the mitigation tactics that are um, available. I think because the webinar will include information on recognizing non-pests, the webinar will really be of value to anybody interested in insects and their biology, as well as to environmental research interested in ecosystem health and food webs. As I noted earlier, the ISCBC has received lots of questions about grasshoppers, as they are such a visible and well-known insect to many of us. Funding for the project has been provided in part by the Council and in part by the governments of Canada and BC under the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, a federal provincial territorial initiative. Funding is administrated by the Investment Agriculture Foundation of BC and the BC Agricultural Research and Development Corp. This project is part of the regional adaptation program delivered by the BC Agriculture and Food Climate Action Initiative. At this point, I will pass the microphone over to you, Dan. I hope everyone enjoys the webinar. Well, thank you very much, Sue. Uh, I'm going to enjoy it most because it's a group of insects I particularly like to talk about. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Sounds great. Okay, that's good. So uh, the geographic focus of this makes it a little interesting, and uh, I'll try to cover as well as the geography a little bit of history here. And I'll try to uh, focus where I can uh, on the caribou. Uh, particularly the southern portion has had a lot of open grass that's over the decades and the centuries has had a lot of grasshopper issues. And those are changing, and we'll talk about how they're changing. Okay, I know this is a long list, but this is my summary of what I'm going to try to remember to tell you. 
Uh, we'll talk about grasshopper species that are found in the area. Not all of them, but the important ones. How to recognize them, how they live. We'll talk about pest and non-pest because some of these are not only not detrimental, they're even beneficial, but others are very serious pests. We'll talk about invasiveness and which are likely to increase their range or their numbers under the coming years of whether it's warming or not, we'll see. Uh, which kinds are likely to increase uh, will be a topic throughout the whole seminar. We'll talk about surveying and how important it is to make your own observations and report them as well. I'm very interested in that and I'd love to hear from people who've had uh, observations that they've made on a lot of grasshoppers in certain years. We'll talk about how to reduce losses if possible. Uh, we'll talk about the possible contributions of land cover, vegetation, and natural enemies like flies that attack grasshoppers and diseases. And a little bit about climate change and what that might uh, portend for grasshoppers. Okay, uh, before I go much farther, I'll say there's a lot of technical information in BC about the biodiversity of the uh, order Orthoptera. In, which includes the grasshoppers, the crickets, the katydids, and their relatives. Uh, you can find that online. If you go to eFauna BC, uh, you can check it out later if you like. You also have a document online, a fairly recent one, on grasshopper monitoring and control in British Columbia. And I'll come back and talk about that and, and maybe add a few things to it that I think have changed in the last few years. Um, not only can you find a key online, but you can find a lot of photos online. Uh, if you go out and collect grasshoppers, this will be one of your favorites, I think. The, it's called the toothpick grasshopper in the USA, but actually in Canada, it's, it's called the bunch grass grasshopper, but it's shaped like a, I don't know what, a bullet train almost. Uh, there are a lot of updates. James Miss Kelly made one recently, uh, well, 2012, but a more recent one as well. Over time, uh, um, Verna Vickery, um, and many other orthopterists in the past. One I want to draw attention to is E.R. Buckle, who was in charge of the Kamloops station back in the 20s and actually put out some very detailed uh, grasshopper lists for the uh, caribou. By the way, if you wanted one for all of Canada, I made one of the roughly 290 species uh, at the request of Environment Canada a while back. These things are available and photo guides and so on. But today I'll talk mainly about a dozen. If you do get interested in this topic and want to find actual specimens online, uh, UBC has a pretty good collection that you, where you can go and check out uh, what they should look like if you're looking for a particular grasshopper. Okay, a little bit of history first. Buckle, who I mentioned, a hardworking entomologist in the 20s and 30s, uh, made grasshopper lists for different parts of uh, British Columbia. Here's one you can see uh, uh, for Vancouver Island. He also studied earwigs and other insects that we consider to be orthopteroid, like the orthoptera. But here's the most interesting one to me, the 1924 list that he and, and uh, uh, Trahern made. He, by the way, Trahern was the first federal entomologist in British Columbia. So this history uh, is fairly recent uh, that there's been any surveying and monitoring and even science at all. So he and Buckle, who was at Kamloops, put together a list. Now, at the top of their list was one that's still with us now. But if you ever happen to run across this name, I just wanted you to know that it's changed. These things have changed over time. The lesser migratory grasshopper is no longer called Mexicanus or Atlantis, but this drawing of it uh, and mention of it, along with the clearwing grasshopper, which they called the roadside grasshopper at that time, we'll get back into that, are the two biggest problems when conditions are warm and dry. And that does happen from time to time. And I recognize that in the last 10 years, there's been three or four really bad years of grasshoppers in the area. The interesting thing to me that is in, in 1924, Trey Hearn and Buckle listed a lot of species that we have absolutely no problem with now. And I suspect that they seem to be on the increase back then, and they were looking forward thinking these might become problems. But out of this list, the ones that are really with us now are the one he calls the roadside grasshopper, which we call the clear winged. Um, that's the one that glistens when it flies. It flies really well and glistens, kind of a yellow sheen, almost like it's reflecting the sun. 
uh, you'll notice that uh, really good flyer spreads rapidly. It would be considered to be invasive uh, in years in which the weather is warm. The lesser migratory grasshopper. Brunners, which interests me very much because I've been following it for the last 20 years thinking it's going to become an outbreak pest, and it finally has. And then a few others that didn't really amount to much. Uh, rangeland species that looked like they might increase because they were pests in the U.S., but not so much here, occasionally perhaps. We'll come back to that. Here's an interesting thing, though. Um, Treherne and Buckle point out that uh, before 1889, they don't really have any data. There was almost no records of what was going on with grasshoppers in the province. And that seems like a long time ago. Uh, it happens to be exactly 100 years after that uh, Mozart uh, that was playing at the beginning was composed. Uh, but around that time, there was a completely different species of grasshopper around. And we don't even know to what extent it was in, um, in British Columbia. We do know, though, Treherne and Buckle tell us that uh, there were very clear cycles, 1890, 1900, 1907, 1914, 1922, and so on. And that continued on, 1930s. And 1944 was a complete emergency, a grasshopper emergency in the province of British Columbia, probably weather-related. Now, if you, although you don't have a lot of data for the caribou, in that area. We do in Alberta, and I just thought I'd show you one of the problems that's arisen. Uh, this is fairly detailed data um, for Alberta. Grasshopper counts. You don't really have to look too closely at this except to see that where the, the, the peaks are. In the 70s, there was a bad grasshopper outbreak. In the 60s, there was as well. In the 80s, very severe. Again, around 2002, 2003. But all of those would increase slowly, become a problem for a year or two or three, and then decline. But lately, we have this situation in which the extremes are more rapid, and they're almost even in odd years in some places. And much of that change has been in the north. And northern Alberta has a grasshopper situation which is very similar to the Caribou, Chilcotin, and nearby areas. So I think Caribou might end up being in a situation of uh, short-term extreme grasshopper outbreaks from time to time. I'd love to come up and take a look at that and find out if they differ genetically from the ones in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Now, I mentioned another grasshopper historically, and you might have heard about it. If you've read Little House on the Prairie and uh, things like that, uh, those stories were all true. There was a grasshopper called the Rocky Mountain Locust. It spread across the U.S., starved farm families out, killed hundreds of thousands of livestock by starvation, but didn't really, supposedly, didn't really get into British Columbia much. So that's very interesting, in case you were wondering about that, uh, that history you might have heard. What it looked like was much similar to the grasshoppers we have now. In fact, this one that I'm particularly concerned about right now, this Brunner's grasshopper, which I'll come back to, is genetically the closest living relative to this species. And I say living relative because the Rocky Mountain locust went extinct. The last one was collected in Manitoba in 1903. Uh, interesting side note, I'll give you two or three little historical things to keep it interesting. In 1876, this grasshopper ate the tents of the Northwest Mounted Police. Uh, People invented dozers to try to scoop them up off of the range and in the crops. Uh, didn't work, I'm sure, very well. Um, most of the control, including in British Columbia, was by arsenic mixed with uh, um, manure or apple pomace or br wheat bran. And I'll bet anything that arsenic is still in the ground. Uh, here's how it was made. Um, sodium arsenide or some other uh, version of arsenic mixed with cattle manure, sawdust, bran. Much of it was used in BC, and this was recommended in the 1924 British Colum grasshoppers of British Columbia. So things have really changed. Of course, we don't do that anymore. Now, in current monitoring guides, if you look over at the left, you can see the clear-winged grasshopper, the migratory, the two-striped, and the red-legged. I would say those are the four that are most reliable for causing problems with either gardens or 
uh, planted crops or even uh, pastures and forage. However, I think we really need to add uh, a couple to this. One is this one I mentioned, Melanopus brunneri. It's called Brunner's spur throat or grasshopper. In the 90s, it exploded in kind of mini outbreaks along the foothills on both sides of the Rockies. And I went up to Kamloops and found it by the millions, and then it disappeared. So it comes and goes, but while it is around, it feeds mainly on broadleaf plants. Last summer up in Peace River, I found it demolishing thistle, alfalfa, canola, but when it would go into a grass field or into a wheat field, it wouldn't touch it. So it has a very strict diet. However, if you were growing alfalfa and this particular grasshopper came along, it would be a big problem. And I think it's one that will increase. Now, rangeland species are also occasionally a problem. Uh, they can reach high numbers. However, I want to point out that most of them are no problem at all. A little gray one, and I'm not sure if it shows well on your screen on the left, is uh, really just a bird food item. The black one on the right flies with yellow wings. Uh, it's more of a, that's the one that crackles in, in the edges of, edges of forest. Not really a problem, but just looks bad. So it's important to kind of identify what you're looking at. Now, the one I'm warning about right now, Melanopus brunneri, the Brunner's grasshopper, is dark. Uh, looks like a typical grasshopper, like the lesser migratory. Has big, wide stripes on the legs. Uh, looks much like a migratory grasshopper, but, but darker, and can be identified from things like the genitalia and so on. And I'm involved right now in an analysis to find out if it differs ecologically, or if the DNA is different, or what's going on, because the northern and British Columbia populations seem to be different from the southern Alberta and Saskatchewan populations, and they're behaving differently. They're more of a pest. So we'll find out more about that, and we'll know later. By the way, if you ever want to identify this major group of the two stripe, the migratory, the packers, the browners, and so on. If you just look under, if you can grab one and look under the chin, if you, you're having an entomological moment, you can look for that spur. You see the knob like an Adam's apple? That entire family has that, and it contains a lot of pest species. The ones that don't have that only have one or two species that are pests. Okay, so here in Alberta, and we should probably do it for British Columbia too, I'd be happy to help. We make posters so that people can tell them apart. For example, lesser migratory grasshopper up on the upper left, big problem. And it has been from Kelowna all the way up to 100 Mile House from time to time. Two-stripe grasshopper, mostly gardens and, and some crops. Striped sedge grasshopper, very noticeable, very prominent looking, and yet absolutely harmless. Northern grasshopper rarely reaches high numbers, but it's found in... Uh, in uh, northern areas from the caribou north. Brunner's in the middle, sort of a typical, typical looking grasshopper, but a big eater on broadleaf plants. Marsh meadow grasshopper, very common in uh, roadsides and pastures and so on, but almost no economic impact at all. Clear winged, probably the most severe pest on the page. It is in outbreak phase, often in Alaska even. It's extremely hardy. The only thing it can't take is rainfall. Uh, huckleberry grasshopper, you can find it in the foothills and mountains, no impact at all. The broad-winged bush katydid is my example of a so-called long-horned or katydid family. Uh, no problem, although when people find it, they imagine it might be a locust considering the size. So here's a little bit of information about the types. Basically, uh, there are three kinds of typical grasshopper. And then the other kind are the crickets, katydids, and bush crickets, none of which are serious pests. But in the shorthorn grasshoppers, I'll just grab this little arrow here. Shorthorn grasshoppers are, uh, oops, uh, the spur-throated, the slant-faced, and the band-winged. But if you look carefully at these, you find that only a few are pests. And I wanted to give you a few basic rules of thumb, and this could be distributed later by a page or online. Any grasshopper you see flying before June 1 is not a pest. It's almost never a problem. Uh, the crop pests and the range pests and the forage pests hatch a little later, uh, late May, early June. Any grasshopper that has colored wings when it flies is not a pest. Uh, 
Any grasshopper that sings or calls or clatters or clacks or makes any kind of noise is not a pest. Any grasshopper that will go into a pasture or forage or crop and not eat is probably going to either leave or eat something else. It's not a pest. And that's on a warm day, of course. And if they stay in rangeland and headlands uh, and don't move into crops, then they probably belong there. And there are many species that just do, never, do not ever come out of dry native rangeland. So those often are not pests. So just the, the raw numbers of grasshoppers is not, a, not pests. So here I say spur-throated, like the brunners and the migratory grasshopper that I mentioned. Some of them are pests, not all. Slant-faced, those are the little delicate ones that sing. They're not pests. And the band-winged, if they're colored, they're not pests. But the one that is a pest is called the clear wing grasshopper. And now you see why it's called the clear wing grasshopper. It's in that band-winged subfamily, which we call Oedipodini. And the Oedipodine grasshoppers, which those are, pretty well all have colored wings except that one. That one has clear, so we call it the clear wing grasshopper. I'll show you a picture of it. Here's the adult uh, female at the top, male a little, little more yellow of the clear wing grasshopper. That is the number one problem on grassland, and it is invasive. It moves its range whenever it gets a chance. As an immature, it looks quite different. The, the youngest ones are black and white. A little older, they're chocolate brown. So that's something to be aware of. This is what the adult looks like. Um, it's uh, got these blotches on the wings, big blotches. Mark on the side, although that's, that's typical. No spur on the throat if you tip the head back. Nice round head. That, yeah, when it flies, it does not have colored wings, but it does glisten. That's probably the number one uh, grasshopper that moves and, uh, and spreads whenever the weather's warm. And here's what it does. This was actually a barley crop, and it was sprayed repeatedly for the clear wing grasshopper. It's amazing uh, how much they can eat. That's not a summer fallow field. That actually was a crop. OK, a little bit about climate, because it's so important to grasshoppers. They're affected by natural enemies, but typically only to knock them back 10 or 20% at best in most years. But weather can wipe them out. Uh, just thought I'd mention a couple of uh, sources I looked at. The uh, Regional Adaptation, Adaptation Strategies series has one on caribou region that's quite interesting. Uh, in it, they have a page actually about pests. Uh, and they talk about warming temperatures um, and what could happen with invasive plants. What of interest to me here is this point, increasing temperatures, Increasing growing degree days, which is extremely important to insects, of course, because they're cold-blooded and they have to hatch and then go through their immature stages, of which grasshoppers have five. Uh, warmer winter temperatures, not too important for grasshoppers because they're fairly well protected from bad winters when down in the ground. The ones that lay their eggs into the soil, they're typically about an inch deep. Uh, when it's minus 30 in the air, it's probably only minus 9 or minus 10 in the soil. So they, they can escape uh, dying from that. But warmer winter temperatures might benefit them a little. Increasing sp spring precipitation will work against grasshoppers. But drier summer conditions will work for them. So I think what we're facing is greater variability. In years in which we have those spring temperatures timed properly to wipe out the hatching grasshoppers, we will. But when we don't happen to have it, the dry, warm conditions might allow them to increase to an outbreak phase in only a year or two, rather than in the traditional three or four. So that's quite likely something that's coming. Uh, I'll mention, too, that warm summers and rain can result in uh, uh, diseases that attack uh, the, the grasshoppers and, and kill them. So that uh, could be a good thing. Uh, a data source I consulted, a little bit old now, I guess, but this 2008 preliminary analysis of climate change in the caribou Chilcotin area has interesting reading in it if you'd like to investigate that. But the bottom line from the point of view of grasshoppers is that historically, average temperature has been slowly increasing. Here's a graph going back to 1895. 
and the rate of increase is more rapid lately. Uh, the projection, uh, and of course it's just a projection for uh, this area, is clearly warming. Um, and if that's the case, what matters is when that warming occurs. If it's in the summer, then certainly the grasshoppers will mature earlier, have more time to lay eggs, perhaps get more eggs in the ground. Um, depending on the timing of the rain, they could even be at an advantage. A little bit of rain late in the year uh, increases their egg survival. Uh, rain in the spring doesn't affect them if they're still in the egg. If they hatch after that, they have plenty to eat. So I'm afraid that the future is uh, looking like uh, it's advantageous to grasshoppers, but uh, the jury's still out, and it depends on what species, so I would recommend a little bit of surveying. Okay, now a little bit of recognition for you. This important one called the lesser migratory grasshopper, which anyone in the Okanagan is familiar with, and Kamloops area, and, and also perhaps uh, Williams Lake and so on, uh, I know that it's there, I found it there, it's, it reaches high numbers occasionally. Uh, uh, even further south, Greenwood had a huge outbreak of this uh, about a decade ago. Um, it eats a wide range of things, and that's one of the problems. But you, you can recognize it from the uh, little stripe on the side of the head and the thorax, the little square looks like window panes on the back wings. When it flies, it has a clear wing. Red leg grasshopper is one that was reported in 1924 as a problem. Uh, again, in the 40s, as a big problem in BC. It can be recognized as by the yellow underside. Uh, and it's often in areas with moisture vegetation cover, interestingly enough. Brunners, I mentioned this several times now, it's like the lesser migratory, but a little heavier, a little darker, feeds almost entirely on broadleaf plants, although it has a varied diet and it has the ability to detoxify toxic plants. Uh, Two Stripe shares that ability. We found that they can eat timber milk vitch without any problem, even though that causes heel click disease and so on in cattle. Um, the nitropropionic acid in timber milk vitch, for example, is digested by grasshoppers, no problem. Interesting story there. But um, it can't really uh, persists for long unless it has some broadleaf plants, although it will get up onto range as well as pasture. This one is an interesting one because you find it and you might wonder about this salmon-colored uh, stripe underneath. Very, very blood-red prominent stripe underneath. That's the northern grasshopper, and they, they hardly have them down south in the USA, but in uh, BC and Alberta they're fairly common and almost never become a serious pest. So they won't, they won't be confused with brunners, if you look for that nice bright red on the underside of the big hind leg, the, the femur. Okay, if you garden or if you have a small crop, uh, this is a serious problem, the two-stripe grasshopper. Easy to recognize. Um, it has two stripes on the back, even as an immature. And as an adult, two strong stripes. The bars on the legs could be broken or solid. It doesn't matter. It's a big grasshopper, but it feeds on everything. Uh, Packard's grasshopper occurs in British Columbia, along with a couple that look like it, but uh, they all have the same sort of appearance, kind of a almost like the two-stripe, but almost kind of a pastel color. And the immature has these pepper spots on the back. Uh, feeds on uh, a mixture of alfalfa and, and uh, other broadleafs and grass. I thought I'd throw in one graph here to show something about the timing of these things. Now, they have immature stages. They hatch first in star, second in star, third in star, fourth and fifth. And a certain amount of time, usually a few days, passes to go from one in star to the next. So in June, the clear winged would be mostly second and third. So you'd be looking for those chocolate brown looking grasshoppers. By July, a fair number of them would be in the adult stage here. I've marked A. So they'd be flying. In August, they'd all be flying. Now, some have the opposite life cycle. Brunner's, unfortunately, has almost an identical life cycle. It's a little bit behind the clear winged, and it catches up. You can see it catching up here in August, the fourth, the fifth, and the adult. Weather determines whether or not they're uh, 
caught up together in one stage or spread out. If they're spread out, of course, that's more difficulty for everybody. I thought I'd point out, uh, we did a study, it's old now, I guess, 2005, but we looked at 55 years of actual weather station data. And we looked at many different trends. And one of them that's really strong in BC is growing season length. And of course, that's good for some plants, but it's also good for grasshoppers. That's published. If anybody wants it, you could you would just have to maybe Google Booth uh, and my name and, and climate. It's uh, International Journal of Climatology. Anyway, let's go back to this uh, control guide. Uh, one of the things that they say is a good rule of thumb, and I think it's true, although it's hi highly variable, that if you have around 12 or higher grasshoppers per square meter, it's pretty well like an animal unit month passing. It's uh, about as much forage as a cow would eat. Uh, they eat about 50 milligrams a day or they clip it off and that's an approximation. Uh, but the most important thing and the best thing I guess if you're actually in the business of controlling the grasshoppers is the damage will be apparent. It's not the kind of problem like insect vectors of disease or something where you don't know what's coming. You will see feeding. Unfortunately that means having to go out and look at it. Now, in this monitoring guide, which I, I, I think very, gives a very good summary, uh, they mention something here that's important to look at, I think. That is that if you have a, a relatively small number of grasshoppers, if you see maybe 6 or up to 12 per square meter, it might look like a lot, but probably doesn't require control. When you get into the higher rates, 24 per square meter. That When you see that, you say, holy cow, look at all the grasshoppers. I mean, that's just standard. Still may be required. Depends on the damage. 25 and up. And by the way, I've seen as high as three or 400 per square meter. You can imagine what that's like. They're touching shoulders. Uh, control required. However, it's likely that that control will not kill them all, but that's not our objective anyway. Our objective is just to reduce them to the point where nature can take over or timing can affect them and uh, they won't uh, cause a complete wipeout. Okay, a little bit on the life cycle. If you want to go look for grasshopper eggs, they're easy to identify. They're a little bit hard to find. They look like brown rice. Uh, they're in pods. Those pods, here's a pod that kind of broke in half when I opened up the dirt clod. They're, they're laid together in pods that align with each other. The eggs are together, typically 30 or 40. And uh, the female puts a little squirt of styrofoam in after to keep the natural enemies out. I use a screen to dig. They're not easy to find. But if you do find them, you could uh, put them in a little bit of household bleach, look inside and see if they're ready to hatch or not. So this hopper is not ready to hatch. This one has eyes. This one even has little legs folded up, and it's ready to come out probably in, in a few days if it gets uh, temperatures above about 12 or 13 degrees C, which the soil does do in a case where it's exposed to the sun. When they do hatch, they're so small, they can be confused with leaf hoppers. Uh, this is a membracid tree hopper. This is a leaf hopper, or like a leaf hopper. There's many different species that are of that same shape and spittle bugs even. But the grasshoppers themselves look like a grasshopper. They have incomplete metamorphosis that makes a baby grasshopper look just like an adult grasshopper without wings. So that's how you can recognize them. If you want to know a little bit more about what species you have, uh, you can take a net, sweep them up, take a closer look at them. I'd be happy if someone threw some in a bag and sent me some paper bag. A plastic bag will rot them and I'll just get soup in the mail. Uh, I'm sure your various government departments can do that too. Uh, but look at how many came to, turned up in my net uh, in that pass that day. So they can be pretty dense in the grass. Okay, here's an interesting thing. I think citizen science and public participation in recording grasshopper years and grasshopper damage and locations, very, very useful. I went on YouTube and just did a search on BC grasshoppers, and I found a, a, a movie that somebody had made, had merit, of a grasshopper outbreak. And he's got two different species going here. And it looks like one of them is lesser migratory grasshopper, 
And I also saw what I thought was a red leg grasshopper in there. So sometimes they had they outbreak together. Uh, nice looking photography. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about these weird looking creatures. There's a, there's two species of of an abris, which is a, 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 a cricket, basically a cricket relative that's in the katydid family. Uh, here in Alberta, the one we have is the Mormon cricket. BC has two of them: Cooley cricket. Um, Little katydids, big katydids. This is a very big katydid called the gladiator katydid. None of those are big problems in Canada. This one, those crickets, can swarm in the USA, but almost never in Canada. If it happens in British Columbia, I would sure like to know about it. But even when there's 5 or 10 per square meter, which is very rare, um, they're not doing a lot of damage for some reason. Here's a case of mistaken identity. The one on the right is called the little spur-throated grasshopper, Melanopus infantilis, and it's not an infant, it's just a small grasshopper. Probably doesn't show, but there's a little bit of the anatomy back here that looks like a deer antler. It looks just like the lesser migratory grasshopper, but it does not leave the range. It won't go into a crop, uh, and it typically just feeds on grass, and not very much. If you see grasshoppers clumped together like this, aggregated uh, as though they're being social, that's probably the clear wing grasshopper. And that brown look with a single white stripe down the back, probably the clear wing grasshopper. I could tell you from a photo or a specimen, and that's something to watch for. They do well in sandy soil. They do well in dry, hot weather. Just review a couple of things when uh, the species that are not pests. Red wing, yellow wing, orange wing, uh, those are not pests. Black wing, not a pest. Tiny and singing, not a pest. So you have to just discount those if you're actually doing a little surveying. Let's talk about natural enemies for a bit here. One of the most important, and Treherne and Buckle and people like that back then, Norman Criddle, who was a fascinating individual back at the turn of the century, uh, um, noted that um, flies are the most important natural enemies of grasshoppers. Flesh flies, um, tachinid flies, bee flies, one way or another many of them attack grasshoppers and they often take quite a bit off the top. Crickets, black field crickets will, this one happens to be preying on a dead grasshopper because like many of the orthoptera they're, they're ready to eat I won't say cannibal because that would be in the same species, but they're certainly ready to eat other orthoptera. But they, they dig up and eat grasshopper eggs. So large uh, outbreaks of black field crickets could be a very good thing. Here's one of those northern grasshoppers with the red stripe on the leg I told you about being attacked by a little red mite. It doesn't really do much harm to the grasshopper except it interferes with its ability to fly and maybe get a mate. Uh, perhaps they're less attractive with those mites on them, but I think more likely they're just not able to move around as much. This grasshopper up, up here is, it looks like it's holding on. This is Disaster Carolina, which occurs all across North America, including BC. It looks like it's holding on, but it's actually dead. It's been infected by Entomophic agrilli, a fungus that infects the nervous system and convinces the grasshopper that it needs to climb up high and sun itself. And then it needs to hold on tight. It dies, and then the spores are more easily spread. Evolutionary strategy there. Here's one of the uh, little spur-throated grasshopper that is a, a named range issue in BC ever since the 20s. But I really, and the, as many times as I've looked, I've never seen it as an actual pest outbreak in BC. So I would say let's not worry about it too much. But if you do find one with this antler in the back, that's the little spur-throated, and it does not attack crops. It's a mild feeder on, on grasses. By the way, this is a fungus that we've been trying to develop as a pest control agent. Uh, this is a soil fungus that we isolated and uh, uh, sprayed onto grasshoppers. It does infect them, uh, kills them. Um, if you, I mean, to me, it's just scientifically interesting, but if you hate grasshoppers, you might like to see it in that predicament there. It's completely covered with fungus. And then they transmit it quite easily to other uh, grasshoppers. I've sprayed that on uh, the airfields of airports 
uh, and controlled grasshoppers that were not typical agriculture or pasture or range pests, uh, but uh, were attracting birds and uh, putting airports in risk of bird strike. So we've actually used it to hold down grasshoppers that would attract birds. There's all kinds of things that could be done with it. Uh, so I know that uh, it's of interest to people on how you can control them. Um, of course, there are, there's pesticide spraying, but it usually it's not particularly economic on grassland. It would be if you had a high intensity valuable crop and it was actively being chewed up um, and not an organic crop, for example, then you could use pesticides. And those things are all recommended on a year-by-year -year basis by the provincial government websites. You should, before taking any pest control action, you should consult the the uh, B BC government recommendations on pesticides to use at that time, because occasionally they change. However, there are a few cultural control methods. I'd say the number one IPM method is to be informed. And that means to go out and look at them to see if they're feeding, to collect them and find out if you can get some help on identifying which species are out there what their likely diet is, whether they're feeding on grasses or broadleaf. And, uh, and also maybe look around and see if you find some hoppers that are hanging from vegetation and killed by naturally occurring diseases. That's an interesting thing to note um, for your own interest and also to, to pass on to anyone giving advice on this topic. So crop and cultivar selection, not very many things are resist, resistant to feeding by all grasshoppers. But some things, uh, there's no worry uh, for certain grasshoppers. Like, for example, the clear wing grasshopper, if it flies into a canola field, it's probably going to e eat the grassy plants and leave. Uh, early seeding, uh, OK, in the USA, this is often mentioned as a way of avoiding grasshopper damage. Maybe not so much in Canada. People seed early or late, depending on the situation, and not so much uh, trying to second guess the insects that are coming. Timing control measures is important. Uh, it's, it's often better to wait uh, if you see hatching, because more could be hatching, and pesticide does not kill eggs. Uh, and only use pesticides if it's really warranted. Are you losing enough actual high-value crop to warrant it or not? It's usually not warranted in pasture and forage, but it's also good to know what you have and, and what species are there. Weed control in actual cultivated crops uh, can reduce egg laying in the late summer. In the past, although we don't do it so much now because of the intensity in the large areas, but they used to use trap strips where they would plant a barley strip or some early growing crop or cover and then treat it only with insecticide and that way they don't have to treat the field. Uh, natural enemies are important. But uh, as much as I, I love to find out about them and do research with them, uh, I, do, I think uh, I don't want to overemphasize their impact. Bee flies are the, uh, the little um, fuzzy looking flies um, that look like bees. And they follow grasshoppers around and actually lay eggs near them so that they're, the larvae of the bee flies can attack grasshopper eggs. Uh, other kinds of flies, like uh, like I said, uh, blowflies, flies, flies, tachinids, various ones will actually lay an egg or a larva right onto a living grasshopper. But by the time they do that, it's usually late in the season. And uh, it may be a kind of revenge, I suppose, for us to say, look at this grasshopper with a alien-like maggot bursting out of its chest. But it's not going to do very much for this year's grasshopper problem. It might be a tiny uh, reduction for next year's. Fungal diseases can be extreme in their impact on grasshoppers, but we have never really been able to reliably harness them. Uh, I've collected 10 different fungi and grown them up and worked on germinating them and keeping them alive and, and weaponizing them in some way dry or wet or in oil. And yes, some do kill, and they do a reasonable job. But it would mean, um, do you want 50% reduction in two weeks, that sort of thing. Sometimes that's OK. Getting them registered is not easy, though. We've gone through all the hoops to register the best out of the 10 and still don't have a registration or a license. 
uh, we can't even get permits to take it from one province to the next to test it. So these things are probably for good reason highly regulated, um, just to be on the safe side, uh, but not really available commercially. And the ones that are available that come from elsewhere are probably not that effective. Uh, predators are really um, something of some, mainly of scientific interest. They're out there. It's important. The take-home message on predators would be, why don't we not take actions that would harm them? So ground beetles, spiders, uh, birds, all those things attack grasshoppers. If we can avoid actions that would harm them, uh, we're working towards a more sustainable solution, maybe taking some of the peaks off the, off the grasshopper populations. So I've tried to leave uh, five or ten minutes for questions, and I, I guess I'll turn it back over to Sue to moderate. Thanks so much, Dan. That was a fabulous presentation. Um, tons of information there. For folks that don't know, we, we've we recorded this presentation. It'll be on our website, and we'll also have a PDF of the presentation that uh, will, will be um, sent to you, and you can uh, share that as well with colleagues or anybody um, who's interested. Um, I'm going to wait for people to um, add some questions uh, in the in the chat box. Um, I know Barb mentioned a cool picture that she took of a miniature tarantula eating a grasshopper, so I'm hoping she'll uh, she'll share that with us. Um, Mike asks a question: How long are the eggs viable for? Okay, egg viability uh, usually one year. Now we think there are two-year grasshoppers. That I know for a fact that there are a couple of species that can uh, not only live two years in the egg, but actually have a two-year life cycle. That was a, an adaptation long ago to living at high elevation. And uh, after the Ice Age, um, you know, 10,000 years ago uh, and so on, uh, where we live opened up for life and it all moved forward again. A lot of those species that did well in the mountains ended up being our current northern insect populations. And some of them brought that life cycle with them. But I would say... 95, 98, 99 percent in that zone of grasshoppers have one year. And the eggs will live in the ground. They have, okay, they have a thing called, okay, first of all, let me back up for a second. Um, insect hibernation is called diapause, and they start going into that diapause when winter is coming. And for grasshoppers, some of our species overwinter in an active form. And that's fine. None of those are pests. They are only bird food for spring. The ones that are pests overwinter as an egg. Uh, and they overwinter as an egg because they have cryoprotectants, an anti-freezing agent in the blood, but also they're in the soil. So if they go into diapause, they do it after reaching a certain level of embryonic development. They grow in the warm soil of September until they hit a certain stage, maybe three quarters developed, then they stop. That's called obligate diapause. They have to go into obligate diapause. But they also have facultative, which means they can go in at any point. So if things turn really bad for them, cold in September, and they're only 20% developed in the embryo, they can go into diapause. So what that means is, if you have a long, warm fall, most of the insect, or most of the grasshopper eggs of a particular species jam up against that obligate diapause stage and they're more or less the same, and they're going to graduate together in the spring. Whereas if you have a cold, broken up uh, fall, you get some that are well-developed and some that are just beginning. So the following year, if they're all coming out together and you have a nice warm spring, boom, they just come out together and it's a big surprise. However, they're easier to control. But if they've come in in a jagged group, some develop, some not, and then the spring is also off and on warm, it can look like it's hatching grasshoppers for a month. So that's what that's about. Interesting. I was going to ask you about the winter. Um, another question on, in the chat box is from Karen, and she says, are grasshoppers blamed for impacts of other pests? Uh, that is an interesting question that's never crossed my mind before. Um, it could well be if the grasshoppers are standing there looking guilty when something's been chewing on a plant. Um, therefore, I think there's two things that need to be done. One is determine what species of grasshoppers you're looking at. 
and uh, maybe on your own accumulating expertise or on the expertise of someone you might want to consult. I don't mind getting photos in the email and that sort of thing, paper bags of hoppers. Um, you find out that they don't even eat that plant anyway, maybe. That's a possibility. Another one would be you might have to spend a little more time and watch and see if they did the damage. But unfortunately, sometimes you show up and you see the damage and no insects around at all. That is unusual for grasshoppers. Usually, if they're the ones that have caused the damage, they're there and their feces is there, which we call frass. Um, long, uh, again, about the size of brown rice, but, but very dark brown. It's there in piles. I guess because grasshoppers are so uh, visible to many of us too that I can imagine, um, you know, people might uh, might blame them because they see them first or quickly. So good, good question, Karen. There's a question from the caribou team, and they're saying, when would you recommend we begin monitoring? I think we have some keeners. Uh, I know, I know, I've got a few keeners that are keen on the citizen science part, Dan. So, um, in terms of uh, late winter, spring, what what would you say? Uh, okay, I don't want to preempt or get in the way of BC entomologists, but if you're going to do that, I'd love to be involved and talk to you about it. Typically, if you measure the soil temperature and you get into a time when you've had consistently above about 12 degrees C, they will, um, they will uh, restart their embryonic growth and then they will hatch and then come out of the ground as a little larva and then they turn into our first instar nymph almost the same couple of hours. Uh, and then you can check those eggs or you can continue monitoring that to see if you have hatch. But it is better to wait if you've only got one trip to the field that you can afford in the spring uh, until you've really got a good hatch going. You can identify them according to the little buds on the back. And I could give you some pointers there or I could do it. Uh, to tell you whether or not you go up mostly the third stage, mostly the fourth stage, by then it would be mid-June probably. And that would be a decent spring survey time. If you want to do a late summer breeding survey, uh, that would be the best time would probably be in August because then you've, you've got hoppers that are adults, they're flying, they're breeding, but they're not really dying off yet. So early August is usually a good time. It depends entirely on the temperature. Cool, that's that's wonderful. And Dan, if we wanted to um, uh, send you information, um, can we? Are we okay to share your email if people wanted to ask you questions? Um, I know that uh, there's some people that are really keen to involve you in some of the some of the citizen science stuff. But um, is are we? Is it okay we can share the share your e your email in the chat box? Is, or would you like us to filter those and send them directly to you from us? Sure, I don't mind getting email. And uh, actually, I see some bona fide pest managers and entomologists in here, Tracy and a few others. I'll scroll through and, and see. So there are also BC people that I'm sure participate. But I, I'd i love to uh, help where I can. And uh, I'm actually going to maybe take a trip there and expand my, my BC collection. I don't get back often enough. And I've never actually stopped very long to collect uh, in Williams Lake and places like that where I know there's tons of grasshoppers and plenty to see and do. I have a keep photo us, guide coming. Sure, I have a photo guide coming out uh, soon and, we'll, and uh, maybe I'll put that on the web if I can. By the way, uh, we're making a calendar. I found I, out of my hundreds of grasshopper photos, I'm uh, unfortunately obsessed with taking photos of them. I picked a dozen good ones, and I'm making a calendar for 2020, and I'll put that on the web. People can have that in PDF if they like. Great. I love it. <laughs> Barb is a, she, she's sending some inform, interesting information. She, said, she says she lives in the, Ch in the Chaco Valley, and this past summer is the first time she saw piles and piles of grasshopper poop. Thanks for that, Barb. Mike is asking, um, Dan, how do you explain low numbers one year and infestations the next? Uh, yeah, that's an amazing thing, what happens. In fact, I've often told people, uh, look, if we use the same rules uh, to um, label grasshoppers as endangered or not that we use for some other things, we would be calling them endangered one year and three years later a pest uh, because some of them nearly disappear. Like even I have a hard time finding some. 
And yet, three years later, they're back to 50 per square meter. And it really uh, is can be blamed on their survival rate and their reproductive rate. Uh, grasshopper female can typically lay, well, it depends on the species, but let's say they have 40 eggs in a pod for some species, and they might lay four of those. Now, that's one problem that some of these species uh, 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 well, have associated with them that make them into pests. Some rangeland, rangeland species will never really be pests because they lay like eight, legs, eight, eight eggs, ten eggs. But if you lay 40 at a time, times three or times four, and if you have 95% survival, you can imagine how quickly those can explode into an outbreak. So the first year, they're up a bit and we don't notice. The second year, you know, they're times 100. So uh, that's why they're good at it. Uh, they're so sensitive to weather. Uh, I mean, natural enemies matter. They do. But natural enemies are usually playing catch up. Uh, you, you mentioned an interesting thing to me before we started, Dan, about um, grasshoppers being something like 50% of the songbird diets. Is that, is that correct? Am I remembering that correctly? Uh, that's correct, and that's based on evidence and real data. In fact, uh, in one of our big pasture studies that we did for a couple of years here in Alberta, um, uh, grass on songbirds, like chestnut-colored longspur and so on, uh, had 70% of the nestling diet made up of just a couple of species of grasshoppers. So that tells me a couple of things. One is we could have a bird decline that might have resulted from bad weather affecting those few species of grasshoppers that overwinter in the active stage and form the food for nestlings and not even know why. Secondly, if we mistake those early season hoppers as pests and get out and start controlling them, we're just hammering bird diets. So there's some interesting take-homes there, and that's one reason i uh, particularly interested in it. A, long, a while back, 2008, I put a photo guide on to recognize some of these non-pest species, which you can find by Googling grasshoppers in my name, I guess. But I'll have a new one next year, so I'll make sure people know about it. And we're actually trying to get a grasshopper watching. Uh, yeah, a grasshopper watching uh, sort of a collective or organization going, in, you know, part, partly to help the people that are trying to identify pests, but more to help the people who are just trying to find out about the environment and the biodiversity. Definitely keep in touch with you about that. And thanks for sharing your email. It's in the chat box there. It's just past one o'clock. Um, I'm going to uh, get get you to answer two more questions um, from folks. Uh, Barb says, what kind of places do grasshoppers lay their eggs? And then Mike follows up with, would harrowing forage stands reduce egg survival? So I'll get you to answer those. Yes. Uh, okay. Where they lay their eggs. Now, if we're talking about the pest species like the clear-winged and the lesser migratory and some of those that I've mentioned, they look for loose soil, uh, maybe around a, a rock or a, uh, or soil that's been maybe loosened a bit, uh, even cracked, right, uh, from drying or whatever. And they the female pokes the abdomen down in there. The abdomen is made, it's got turgites on top, sternites on the bottom. Imagine like two plates that connect together with an accordion of soft tissue in between like a vacuum cleaner hose. They can stretch that out about three times its length and poke it into the ground, lay those eggs deep. So if you wanted to find them, you wouldn't have to dig deeper than about an inch and you should look in fairly loose soil. Um, now about the harrowing. Yeah, um, they did studies in the 20s, 30s, and 40s to see what kind of soil tillage would affect grasshoppers. And deep plowing, but no one wants to do that, I hope, uh, does um, really hammer them. I mean, it, it reduces the numbers greatly, but it also is a very bad idea in places where we want to practice soil conservation. Uh, just simple harrowing not too deep is not going to matter much to grasshoppers because if they end up a, an inch deeper or a, an inch um, up or down is not going to matter. If they're exposed on the surface, they can actually dry if there's no snow, uh, die from cold if there's no snow cover, or they could be eaten by predators. So there's a little bit of an impact, but it's not that reliable. So I would say decisions regarding harrowing and soil tillage and so on, 
should be made uh, based on other um, reasons. We sign off. Well, that is great. I'm, I'm conscious of our time, Dan. I don't want to keep you too long because I know you're a busy guy, but really wanted to thank you so much for that presentation. It was fantastic. Um, really wanted to thank you for sharing your expertise with us today, too, on behalf of the Council and for on behalf of everybody listening. We're going to send out a short link uh, to an evaluation survey to everybody who participated, and we'd love to get your input so we can get um, your feedback and, your, and some ideas for future webinars. Please check our website. We've got some great webinars coming up uh, in the new year, um, and so check the website to register. And Dan, we'll definitely keep in touch with you in terms of the citizen science piece, as well as um, um, your calendar and your new field guide. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Dan, before we sign off? Oh, you might be already muted. Anyway, folks, thanks so much for coming today. Um, thanks. And thanks again, Dan, and we'll see everybody next time. Is that you, Dan? Okay. I just wanted to say goodbye. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye-bye.